So we uh, continue in our series on I Will Not Be Afraid. Um, and we're actually at another one of those weeks where we're going to kind of do the oxymoron to that, where we're going to do the, the contradiction to that actual phrase. Because in our text this morning is this amazing lesson that says that fear actually leads us to forgiveness. And forgiveness leads us back to fear, or better said, reverence, worship of God. <clears throat> uh, yeah, the, the plane, I think, dried me out a little bit, so I'm going to drink some water, and hopefully my voice won't crack too much for you all. Excuse me. When we were back at... Um, Theo's house, a four-year-old who just had his birthday, and had some fun. We were out swinging, and a little boy came walking down the street. Actually, he was on his little, his little um, scooter, kind of skateboard scooter, one of those, those little tiny ones. And he comes up, and he starts talking to us, and, can I swing? And we had already talked about when we saw him, oh, should we let him swing? And so we, we put him on the swing and let him swing, and we're chatting there, and he had, does your mom know you're where you're at? How old are you? He's seven, almost seven, so he's six years old. Now, just walking down the street all by himself, and nobody's coming looking for him. And he says, well, my sister's at home. Uh, does she know where you're at? No, she doesn't know where I'm at. But, but I'm watching for my mommy, because if my mom comes, I'll get a whooping. <laughs> You'll get a whooping, huh? Yeah, I, if my mom sees me, I'll get a whooping, because uh, cause I'm not supposed to be out like this. Well, then, don't you think you better go back home? I said, you know, um, I, I understand what whoopings are like. I used to get a fair amount of whoopings myself. In fact, I remember at five years old, walking home from school, we had, I think it was about, a, what was it, a six-mile walk over hills and snow and both directions, you know, we're uphill, you know, that it was, it was that kind of a walk. Not really, it was here in Southern California, but, but it was probably about a half-mile, mile walk that I had to walk. So we're walking home, and, and I see my dad driving up, and I'm, oh, no, I'm in trouble. I'm actually expecting a whooping, because I think I was on the wrong street, and my dad's driving up there and he's picking me up and he turns out I wasn't in trouble. Didn't get a whooping that time because he was there to say, your new sister has been born, Rosalie was born, and he was picking me up from school to take me, to, to take me home and I think maybe eventually to meet our new little sister. But, but I understand what whoopings are like. And, and there used to be times when we'd be at home and like, okay, mom's coming or we're gonna be in trouble. You know, are we going to get the whooping now or something like that? But, but I have to tell you that my attitude's kind of changed these days. If I'm home and Debbie's not, um, I maybe try, I will try to do something. She probably doesn't always know this, but <laughs> I'll, I'll try to do something. Maybe I'll clean up the sink. Maybe I'll fold the clothes. Well, a little bit of them. Uh, but, but I'll try to do something just to say, hey, I, I love you. So that when she comes in, there's something positive for her. Um, it, now, maybe that is because I don't want to get a whoop. In. No, no. <laughs> but, but if you think about that, <clears throat> the psalmist here has some pretty strong words he says. In fact, the key phrase in our text for today comes actually out of Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. And it says, If you, Lord, should mark our iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. John Wesley, before he had really committed his life to Christ, was actually attending a Vesper service. And at that service, they, were actually, they actually read Psalm 130. And he credits this psalm as being the psalm that drew him to God. And great ministry that came out of that. that. Wesley was so moved by the song that comes out of Psalm 130 that, the, that it opened up his heart to accept the gospel of salvation. Psalm 130 begins at verse 1 and says this, A song of a sense, out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive 
to my cry for help. A song of ascents, now there's a couple different potential meaning to that, a song of ascents. It's one that's people are coming back to repent. They're coming to ask God for forgiveness. And so that's why you're, you're looking to come back up, up to where God is. Uh, but can you imagine also that as the people would be coming to Jerusalem, they would be singing songs and celebrating. And imagine them singing this song as they're going up to Jerusalem, maybe for the Passover or one of the other celebrations that they would go there for. They're, and a, the pilgrims are going up and they're singing about the fact that they, as they cry out to the Lord, that God hears their voice, that God listens to them and their cry for mercy. Because that's why you go to Jerusalem. That's why you have the sacrifices. The sacrifices, especially with uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, it's that one day a year when now we're all going to get our sins forgiven, and we've got to get there every year, and, and it's something really significant. And so they're, oh, God, have mercy on us because we're sinners. We're messed up. We've blown it. A few years ago, we, and, and we did a, a series uh, at Christmas time called The Promise of Christmas is Jesus. Jack Countryman actually wrote a devotional book that I used to some for that. Uh, by the way, it's back in about 2012, so it's, I guess more than a few years ago. But anyways, <laughs> so in, in it he writes a section called Mercy. And he says, for every action, there is an equal but opposite reaction. This is Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion and a basic principle of physics. Does it apply in the spiritual realm, Jack asks. God freely gives us his mercy. That's an action. And what is our reaction to his action? Praise. Mm -hmm. And may it be equal to the weight of his mercy in our lives. Countryman goes on, he says, it is God's very nature to give his children mercy and grace but not because we deserve it. His mercy endures forever. And forever is a very long time. There is no expiration date. Why does God do this for us? Simply because he loves us. He continues, God sends a sunrise every morning. He listens when we talk. And he gave us his only son at Christmas how can we react to God's infinitely gracious actions with our praises by worshiping him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? No, that reaction can never equal God's generosity, thankfully. He is more concerned about our hearts than about the laws of physics. See, worship allows us to seek God and ourselves as we really are. Worship reminds us that we need God, that we're desperate for him to take our sins away. It reminds us that we are assured of mercy because God loves us. So the psalmist goes on in verse three, now the, to the heart of this psalm, he says, if you, Lord, should mark our iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? I, I, I'd like to sometimes think of object lessons, so I thought it would be a good idea this morning if you would all make a list of all the sins you've committed. Really? <laughs> make a list of all the sins you've committed. And you know how the Wickenburg door, you know how Luther wrote his treatise on the Wickenburg door? I think we should post all of our sins on the outside of the church building for the whole community to see. <laughs> You might want to include your picture so we know <laughs> who committed the sins if we don't know your name, okay? So, think about it. If the Lord was going to write down every one of our sins, who could stand in the presence of God? Because it's really about standing in the courtroom of God. And what one of us, if God was keeping track of every single one of our sins, could stand there in front of him? Yep, I did them. Would we be proud? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's another one I did. <laughs> oh, yeah, you should have been there, God. It was, oh, you were there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't think we'd be there like that. I don't think we'd be standing up if God was reading through his entire list of every single sin, sin we committed. 
Now, some people think that's why we live for an eternity, because it's going to take an eternity to get through all of our sins, right? And, and each person and every little thing. No, don't think so. Because what the psalmist is saying is, is that God doesn't make a list and keep track and write down every single one of our sins. You see, if, if he did, who of us could stand in front of him and in his presence? Because to actually mark your iniquities is to make a written record of them. And why would you make a written record? Have any of you kept track of things that someone else has done? Peter came to Jesus and said, um, hey, Jesus. And he, and he thought he was going to really do the, a, a really good one. The law said you had to forgive somebody three times. So, so Peter says, okay, three, that's a perfect number. Next perfect number is seven. And he comes to Jesus, Jesus, what do I have to do? Forgive my brother if he sins against me seven times. Now, I'm kind of thinking that Peter was expecting Jesus to say, whoa, Peter, oh man, you're way above the rest. You know, you're something else. Seven times. But what does Jesus say? Oh, no, Peter. Seven be times seven. If you can keep track of 490 sins that your brother committed, after you've forgiven each one of them, good luck, Peter. <laughs> and who of us can stand if God was to write down every one of our sins? And if he did that, why would he? So he can punish us? That's kind of our way of doing it. You did it again. You forgot to take out the trash. I've been asking to take out the trash every day, and it's been sitting there now for four days. In fact, the last four weeks in a row, make it five now, you haven't taken out the trash. And I had to do it again. And we keep track, don't we, of how many things somebody does wrong. But not God. Because if God did, none of us, none of us could stand in his court. Does God hate sin? Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. Sin's pretty serious in God's view, isn't it? But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I found a quote from Billy Graham that I thought was interesting. He says, I tell you that God hates sin just as a father hates a rattlesnake that threatens the safety and life of his child. Any of you seen rattlesnakes up here? I know Leslie, yes. <laughs> God loathes evil and diabolic forces that would pull people down to a godless eternity just as a mother hates a venomous spider that is found playing on the soft, warm flesh of her little baby. Does God hate sin? Billy Graham goes on, it is his love for man, his compassion for the human race that prompts God to hate sin with such a vengeance. He gave heaven's finest that we might have the best. And he loathes with a holy abhorrence anything that would hinder our being reconciled to him. Does God hate sin? See, to, to fear God, is to recognize that God is angry about sin and what it does to us. What, did, what happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden? They ran and hid because they were afraid of God. Moses experienced that fear too, didn't he? In, in <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 9, it says, I feared the anger and wrath of the Lord, for he was angry enough with you to destroy you. <laughs> well, yeah, they only made this golden idol. They uh, only uh, rejected God, who had got them out of bondage and slavery and across the river and at the Red Sea and set them free. And here they are worshiping other gods, exactly the thing he said not to. And Moses says, I was afraid for you because of your sin. And then it's Hebrews 10, 26. Look what the New Testament says. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice is left, 
but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. And anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And then listen to this final phrase. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. If that God has forgiven you and you reject the sacrifice of the blood of that the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. Have any of you heard of the, the sermon Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? You went to Bible school, you undoubtedly did, or seminary. Uh, a great sermon by one of the great American preachers, Jonathan Edwards. And in it, it, it there's this great title, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And what are you going to do if you're in the hands of an angry God? But Jonathan Edwards' goal is to try to get people to recognize their sin. In fact, he's really after not just his church, but, but all of America to repent of their sin and to turn back to God. And he wants them to turn back before it's too late for them to get his God's forgiveness. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Well, there's a biblical term for this, and the, the word is iniquities. Or, or other word that we tend not to use a lot these days is sin. What are your iniquities? You know, if you're at home, so you're in a more private place right now, you can just shout them out and let everyone there know, because they probably know already anyways, right? But what are your iniquities? What are your sins? How are you, and here's an important one, I think, for the body of Christ. How are you rejecting God's will? There's different things that God's calling us to do. You see, and we talk about this sometimes in theological terms, that there are sins of omission and commission. They're the things that, that we commit blatantly. We go out and sin, and we know we're sinning. And then there's the things that we simply omit because we just didn't do it. Our, our neighbor's next door, and we ignore them. I think that's called not loving your neighbor, right? Yeah. Uh, or, or we talk about them, or we criticize them, or we get ticked off at them because they moved the property line or something like that. And... And, and if you think about it, there's ways that we are sinning against God by not doing things. So my question is, how are you rejecting God's will? And are you willing to take that very serious to actually say, God, show me how I'm rejecting your will? Most of us know when we're sinning, don't we? Now, we might not like it to be called a sin. We might not like someone to recognize that our action is sin. But most of us know when we're sinning what we're doing. But what is it that you're allowing in your life that God considers to be a sin? An iniquity. Something worth his son dying for. You see, if, if here's one. Boy, this is across our country. If you tend to be living more for yourself and what you want, isn't that sin? I think that's different than living for God and what God wants. So if I'm not living for God and what God wants, I'm living more for myself, aren't I sinning? Well, verse 4 has a good word for you. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. <clears throat> what the psalmist is trying to say, and this is amazing. We're talking Old Testament stuff here, right? The Old Testament is telling us that God is a forgiving God. And that when God's people repent, God forgives them. That, that God is good and loving and he wants to give us forgiveness. 
And so he says, there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. And so God's forgiveness actually moves us to start fearing God. But not in the sense of, you know, oh no, I can't go home because I sinned, because I lost the good shirt, or I got it dirty, or I tore my pants. I was uh, riding my bicycle one time at a friend's house. And, and we rode up this hill, and I got almost to the, to the top of the edge of the hill, and I couldn't keep going, and my bike went backwards. The problem was it went backwards onto the pavement, and I landed on my elbow. And I had this super bloody big gouge out of my elbow. And the, the, my friend's mom comes out and sees all this, and I, it's a mess. And she says, well, we need to call your mom, and we need to take you to the hospital or to a doctor. And no, no, don't call my mom. I, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'll be okay. I think it was 15 stitches later or something like that. But I, no, because I, I didn't want to have to deal with my mom. Well, it, are we that way with God? Where there's things that we just, we don't, we don't want to go to him with. So we know it's sin. And, and the psalmist says, it's God's forgiveness that makes it so we respect him. We worship him. We fear him. McLaren said, the word rendered forgiveness literally means cutting off and so suggests the merciful surgery by which the cancerous tum tumor is taken off of our soul. God wants to cut the tumor of sin out of us. And when that happens, then don't you respond with fear, with worship. Now the problem is, uh, too many Christians don't understand, haven't haven't felt bad enough about sin, right? You're kind of like the the, the religious people. You're, you're all goody people, right? But what do you call good two shoes, goody two shoes, right? You're all wonderful. You don't sin, right? And so it's the woman who's been caught in adultery. It's the woman who was the prostitute who comes there washing Jesus' feet with her hair and putting perfume on them. Why? Because for her, forgiveness really made a difference in her life. And what about you? You see, God's forgiveness leads us to that fear, that worship, that love for God. An old, old song says, He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To add an affliction, He added His mercy. To multiply trials, His multiplied peace. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure, his power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. And that's the beauty of God's forgiveness. God gives his forgiveness again and again and again. And we sin, and he continues to offer his forgiveness. And Colossians 2 says, When you were dead in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us our, all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it, to the cross. Paul is a man who says, I know what it's like to be forgiven. I fought against Christ. I actually murdered Christians. I put them in jail. I'm really a messed up, rotten sinner, Paul says. And he says, because of that, though, I came to Christ. Christ forgave me. I understand the beauty, the blessings, the joy, the thrill, the peace, the comfort of forgiveness. And later he'll teach the world to come to Christ for forgiveness. The psalmist goes on as he's saying, okay, Lord, I'm coming to you. I've been crying out for mercy. 
I'm finding that mercy in you. You forgive me. I'm bowing down to worship you. And then in verse 5 it says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Have you ever stayed up all night? I was uh, working uh, with the Civil Air Patrol as a high school student. And we were actually supposed to guard Chafee High School. And we stood out there all night guarding Chafee High School. Now, I should add a little bit to it. It was a civil defense drill in which they were actually pretending that there was this major catastrophe, bomb thing or something like that. And the next morning, they started bringing in patients that were totally decorated up. I mean, these guys looked real. The, uh, arms broken off and bones sticking out and bloody faces and burn scars and all kinds of stuff. And all these bodies and patients were being brought in and here they were the Civil Air Patrol and were guarding everything. And that was all night long. And the frustrating thing was it wasn't until the next morning that actually I was supposed to go home. Well, mom and dad didn't come until late in the afternoon. And I'm sitting out there on the corner trying to stay awake. It's kind of like the guards who were saying, can the night get over? <laughs> I'm really ready to go home. I'm ready for this to be finished. Uh, by the way, Jonathan, I messed up something on the screen. I don't know how it's going online, but I, I do notice that I just somehow somehow moved the whole red box. So yeah, you might check it online and see if people are seeing <laughs> everything or not. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but but you, you, have you ever come to that time where you've been at the end of the night, oh man, I want this day to be over, I want this night to be finished. And that's exactly what the psalmist is saying. Like the guard who's been waiting there all night long and wants to just go home and go to bed. It's, it is saying, please Lord, I'm waiting for you to come. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say. On the Lord. And I love Psalm 40, verse 1, that says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. I don't know about you, but I'm a little bit impatient. Driving in traffic, waiting for something to come, just impatient. So, why does the Lord want us to wait? And how do you feel when you're forced to wait? I keep forgetting, you guys are all holy saints and you don't <laughs> understand sin and stuff and frustration and stuff like that. How is it possible to be patient when God's saying, Because you see, we trust God in what he says. We put our hope in God. And so the psalmist says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. My hope is in what God has said he's going to do. I don't need to worry about that. And so therefore, I can wait on him however long it takes. If that means it's another 10,000 years before Christ returns, we can wait on him because we can trust him to keep his word. If the election doesn't go the way you want it to, plan for it, you can trust God, because God is accomplishing his purposes. If you don't like all the frustration about COVID-19, if you disagree with the governor, or you agree with the governor and disagree with the people who disagree with the governor, it, you can trust God, because God keeps his word, and God can be trusted. And he ends our psalm with some, some great statements. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love. And with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. What did John the Baptist say to the disciples? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What did Jesus' name mean? 
It comes from the Old Testament for Joshua, Yeshua, Yahweh, our salvation. Yahweh saves. Jesus is Yahweh. He's named after his very father. Jesus, Yeshua, Yahweh, our salvation. He will save his people from their sins. Mary and Joseph are told, that's what you're supposed to name him. Name him Yeshua, because he will save his people from their sins. Haven't we all missed the mark? That's the word for sin. Tragically, when you think about it, we've totally missed the mark of God's righteousness and his glory. We probably miss it even as we come to worship. We're guilty of sin. And frankly, our sins are an offense to God just like that rattlesnake. And we failed. We failed God. <clears throat> X4 says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But because of what Jesus did, because he is that one, he himself will redeem Israel from all their sins because of what he paid with his blood on that cross. Our sins. And I just want to warn you of this one. What happens if a Christian rejects the payment of the blood of the Lamb of God for their sins? And I'm not talking about somebody who was just called a Christian. I'm talking about somebody who knew Jesus. What happens to the follower of Jesus Christ who rejects the payment of Christ's blood? For their sins. Because if you don't accept, if you reject, I should say, if you reject the payment for your sins, if you reject the mercy of Jesus Christ, then aren't you rejecting his forgiveness? <coughs> and therefore, aren't you rejecting his redemption? He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. So put your hope in the Lord, in the Lord, with his unfailing love and his full redemption, and he will redeem you from all your sin. Jesus, thank you for what your word has tried to say to us today. Thank you for the forgiveness that you long to give to each of us and to a world that's totally rejecting you, you even more desire to give your forgiveness. And for anyone who's here or listening or watching that hasn't accepted your forgiveness for their sins, I pray that your Holy Spirit would draw them out into the open, would draw their hearts to you right now, and they'd accept this forgiveness that you bought and paid for with your blood. And Lord, I pray for those of us who have already accepted that payment, that we would live differently, and that the people around us would see you in us because you forgave us. And Lord, I also pray that it would make a difference in the way we worship. God, I pray for that filling of your Holy Spirit that would anoint our worship, that we would be so humbled by coming into your presence, so moved by your forgiveness, that we would worship.
worship you with fear, with respect, with honor, that we would give you the glory that you deserve. In Jesus' name.